this is the question and answer period that they told me I was good at. <laughs> they lied, that didn't cost anything to get in, so <laughs> probably equal. Does anybody have a question? Jack? Yes. Question over here. What do I do when nobody asks me a question? Over here. Over here. Dad. 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 No. Dad. Dad. My students are all going to ask me a question. Yes. Olivia. Um, in your first talk, you mentioned 3 a.m. a lot. Is there any particular reason it was 3 a.m.? It's pretty much the dead center of the night. The last hour, and then it starts to get false dawn, and pretty soon you can go all the way up to dawn by about 7 o'clock. And 3 a.m. is, is, I remember there, there, was a, there was a song in the 40s about being awake at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. is when there's not much to do except think. And poets are not generally a jolly lot. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they rank second in suicide. <laughs> Dennis actually are first. <laughs> You have people who are going, yeah, good. <laughs> Which is probably the reason why they commit suicide. They're just trying to help everybody, and nobody, likes it. nobody appreciates it. Yes? Do you have a favorite time to write, like, during the day? Uh, I, have, I have a perfectly normal schedule if I lived in Japan. <laughs> I usually go to bed anywhere from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then I get up about two in the afternoon. And I did that because my wife used to work on, she was a nurse. She worked on the 3 to 11 shift. So by the time she came home and, and um, unwound a little bit. And... Anyway, it took till two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to bed, so then, then I could, after I tucked her in, I would go up and write. Um, it's important, I think, to write as much as you can at the same time and go through the same rituals. Um, my older son wrote an article once, and he was a football coach, and he wrote an article, and he was also a track coach, and he wrote about the ritual, how every, especially in track, the shot putter doesn't just pick up the, the shot and walk out. Instead, he's got a certain number of things he has to do to loosen his neck, and he hefts the weight several different times, then he puts it in and it doesn't fit, and he takes it out and puts it back in again, and after about three or four minutes, he throws the shot. Um, and what he's doing, of course, is getting his body to tell his brain, we are now in chocolate throwing mode. And that's what you need to do, I think. I think it helps to do it anyway. I don't, you don't necessarily need to do it. Some people can sit down and write any time. Um, but if you set up a ritual like that, and you go through, and a lot of writers have it, it's not just poets, um, it will help you, to, help you so that when you sit down and you're looking at that blank piece of paper and nothing is as blank as that blank piece of paper, especially if you've already gotten money for what you're supposed to put on it. <laughs> when you sell a novel, at least you used to be able to sell uh, three chapters and an outline. And then they gave you some money and gave you a date when you had to have the other 90,000 words done. And it's the first time you sit down with 90,000 words ahead of you to write, it's tough to find one. Um, Jeff Ford, who spoke here last year and who's a famous uh, fantasy writer, or uh, Fan, it's not fantastic. What's that realism? Magical, that magical realism. Magical realism. He's a really a, a magical realist. And when he was here, he and I talked writing all the time. And we had a technique where we agreed that we would sit down at the computer and whatever the first line was, we would write it down. And we would write a story from that. And we wrote a lot of stories. I mean, he, we wrote separately, but he, uh, we wrote a fair amount of stories, and most of them were accepted somewhere. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good technique, and the focus of it is really 
to get you not to worry. If you're sitting there going, are they going to like this? Is it going to work? It gets harder and harder. Whereas if you said to yourself to begin with, I don't care where this goes. Maybe tonight isn't a night I'm working on the money stuff. Maybe tonight's just a night when I'm just going to let things flow out. And uh, the, maybe the greatest thing about being a writer isn't as you would think, and I'm only doing this on speculation, um, it isn't getting rich and it isn't getting famous. It's those moments when it's like you're taking dictation. The words just pour out of your fingers. And it's not even your voice in your head that's giving them to you. And you don't know where things are going next, but it's a great ride. And sometimes you get to chapter 15, and your protagonist is in a jam, and there is the very thing that he needs to get out of it, and you put it in on the second page. And you go, damn, I'm good. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether anybody gives you money for it, or they like it, or it ever gets published, or anybody else reads it. Because that feeling in itself is what it's all about as a writer. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Um, you mentioned before like how the 60s were a kind of rebellious in our time period. Um, and as you said yourself, you've seen quite a few time periods. How do you think that influenced writing now and at the time? When compared to say preceding law period like the beat mix and that Oh, there were movements preceding it. And I think there are movements now. One of the things that amazed me when I came back and did that uh, thing in Jack's class was that the students were like students from the 60s. I mean, I thought everybody was coming back to get their ticket to the job world and put in as little time as they possibly could. And that idea of wanting to learn more and to know more, I thought that was gone. I haven't been here for 10 years. And when I retired, it was heading pretty strongly in that direction. And I was amazed that, it was, that there were so many bright people and excited about learning things. So I think that, I think, you know, they say save your Confederate money, save your Confederate money, the South is going to rise again. Keep your eye out for the 60s. Because <laughs> actually, you have the tools for a revolution. They don't control social media yet. That means you can talk to anybody, anywhere, and say anything you want. And at the moment, at least, they can't stop you. I mean, it's a scary, it's a tool. And like any tool, it can be used as a weapon. So the 60s weren't a happy and necessarily just a happy time either. There were some real dangers. And there's some real dangers in that, but I think, in, I know even sometimes I get caught up in the myth that this generation, uh, because you'll sit and text to one another face to face, um, that, that you're disengaged from each other. And I've, I've come to realize that's not, that's not the, the truth at all. That, that social media actually bind people together. Even things like Facebook, and even people, even old people go on that <laughs> and read about their grandchildren and their and their grand nephews and things. And in a way, families separated by distance are brought closer together. So I think this really, this generation is actually going to be um, more loving and more idealistic, and maybe make the changes that the children of the '60s couldn't make. Over here, Jeff. Bill, in today's world of self-publishing, etc., are agents still relevant? And should aspiring writers try and hook up with an agent? I don't know. We were talking about this earlier um, when we were at dinner, and I think if I were young, I would start up self-publishing because for two reasons. One is the decision on your work by a publisher is again made by a committee. And it's made on the basis not on how, how good it is, but on how likely they believe they are to sell it. So what happens to a lot of writers is um, they send out their works, and their works get rejected. 
and they think, well, my stuff must be no good. And it eats away at their confidence, and then they, start, they send out things less and less and less and less. Um, whereas if you self-publish, um, excuse me a minute. If you self-publish, you don't have to care. You still got to, writing has changed. Even way back, people like Dickens were not only great writers, they were great self-promoters. My generation, self-promotion was frowned on. The easiest way to get yourself ostracized by other writers was to promote yourself all the time. But the writers who did that, the writers whose lives got talked about, got gossiped about for that matter. Um, they were the ones who tended to last. Like Poe. If Poe hadn't been a junkie, maybe we wouldn't even be reading him. The fact that he was, and well, not just him, Lord Byron, all those romantics, they were all smoking opium <laughs> and writing about it. And because it wasn't real commonplace, people were going, oh, what wonderful visions you have of the, of the supernatural world. And they were going, yeah, here, have the pipe. <laughs> um, an agent will help you if you can get one, but he's looking at it with the same eye that the editors and the book committee are going to be looking at it with. Is this something that can sell? There's a lot of good agents, and they will fight your case. And if you want to go the standard, traditional publishing route, you're going to need an agent. It's very difficult to send something in over the transom now, because it's so easy to put a manuscript together and submit it online. You can do that. It used to be you had to type up a 200-page novel, and you'd have to type up the whole thing five times and to send them out to five different publishers now. You can sit down and in maybe two or three hours, you can send your novel out to the five publishing houses. And you don't have to go and do the research writers used to have to do to see, what, does this publishing company do science fiction? You can't just send it out blind. You have to do a lot of research. Now, you can go on uh, writersdigest.com. There's about a, at least a dozen, dozen other sites that will tell you what the publishers want and even sometimes what kind of novels, like they used to just say that they publish romance. Now there's different genres in that. Uh, erotic romance is a whole separate thing. It's not quite porn, but it's got a foot in one camp and a foot in the <laughs> romantic camp. So if you want to go the traditional route, I'd say try and get an agent, but don't stop writing while you are and don't stop self-publishing. That was the other thing about social media. Now, when you go with a book, they ask you how many followers do you have. If you've published it yourself, they want to know how many copies you have, you've sold. And if it's, even if it's like 5,000 copies, that shows them somebody's going to buy this book, and they're much more likely to take it. And they also know you have followers, so you can market to them directly. That's another reason for self-publishing is when you go to the traditional publisher, you get 10 to 15 percent of the royalty, of the, of the money that the publishing company gave. Now, it's true. They put money into it to get it printed. They hire salesmen and stuff, and they risk, they risk their capital, so they do deserve a, de a decent size of it. But if you self-publish, you get to keep it all. You do it on Amazon, you get to keep it all, but I think 15%. So in other words, you don't have to have a bestseller to be able to make a living as a writer. Although I don't think there's really more than maybe a thousand writers in the country that live just on their writing. You know what the rest of them do. They teach. <laughs> you scratch an English teacher, you're probably going to find a would-be writer. And more than likely a poet. Because they got to eat too. Do we have one last question, maybe, for Bill before we uh, say goodnight? Anyone? Yes. Do you mind um, mentioning one or two of the poets that might have influenced you? Uh, 
Gerard Manley Hopkins. There was a poem that I was going to read that I took out of the list where I, where I tried to pattern my poetry after, uh, after Hopkins. Robert Frost, I think, is one of the great, great ones. Leonard Cohen, don't discount a poet just because they sing. There's a lot of really good poets out there. Of course, you do have to be able to sing in order to make a real living at it. <laughs> but they're, they're mainly the, the poets, at least, that have influenced me. I, I, would, read, I would read them. I'd read as many poets as you can, both contemporary and the old masters, although I tend to like the old masters better. Oh, John Donne, all my, all my love poems. Most of them were sonnets, and then they were patterned after Donne. Alex, yeah. Alex had one. Go ahead, Alex. I was, I was just curious if, if you uh, said you were interested in playwriting, if you've ever done, if anything's ever been produced, if you've ever gotten into uh, screenwriting at all. Actually, uh, I had a play that was the second uh, play performed at Brookdale, and then it was it won a it won a contest by a prominent uh, literary magazine, and they put it on. Uh, out in Kansas. This was Kansas in 1969. Uh, my wife was very beautiful and uh, <clears throat> had a wonderful sense of style. And she went out and had, she, had a, she had a maxi skirt that unzipped and became a mini skirt. And when they saw that, it was like we'd invented fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, to show you how different the times were, um, there was a, a African African American guy who was there. We were talking to him. We were talking to the girl who was with. We, and my wife said, "Oh, are you are you a couple?" And he looked at us. He said, "Do I want? Do you think I want to risk my life?" I mean, it would, it, they were racist times. Were much more so than now. Maybe times. Maybe there. Maybe the times are. Pretty close to as racist, but it's nobody. Everybody keeps it down. Before people didn't care what who they hurt. Not everybody was a child of the '60s. Um, playwriting is a good is good practice for screenwriting. And playwriting, the reason I always said to try to work in a lot of different genres is. Um, Playwriting will help you develop your dialogue. You won't have to read if you if you put a lot of exposition in there, a lot of explanation. Your readers, unless it's a real hardcore reader, they're going to get bored quickly. But if you can put that information in the words of the characters, it works a lot better. So I, uh, playwrights, playwriting is a good place to start. Um, it is one place though where you have to pretty much. Make your contacts yourself. Get into the, get into theater, whether it's local theater or whether you go to New York, and, and do it there. Thank you very Home. And again, thank you, Bill. That was wonderful.